Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. King David wanted God to be in his life, but not only that. King David wanted God to be his life. What does that mean? That everything that David thought upon, everything that he said in a course, all of his actions, they would all be founded in the purpose of God, all reflect the glory of God. In other words, when David writes this psalm that we're going to study this evening, we learn something. And that is that David was consumed by a passion for the living God, that he would be submissive to him and that God would rule over his life for God's pleasure and not his. David realized something. When God is pleased with someone's life, how do we know that? God instills within that person a joy, a kingdom joy, a joy that comes from the heavens and is imparted to that person. That should be your desire and my desire. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 17. The book of Psalms and Psalm 17. Now, we're going to learn many principles about ordering our life. And we're going to see how David thought of things so that we can think that same way. We need to remember, as a person thinks in his heart, so is he. And that's why we need our hearts to be established by God, that we would have a heart that is corrected for the things of God. Let's begin. We find here that this psalm is called Verse 1, Tfilah le David, which means a prayer of David. And that word for prayer in Hebrew, Tfilah, can, can have a relevance as filling in. It speaks about the inadequacy of human beings. It speaks about the fact that if we attempt something in and of ourselves, we might know what to do. We might even know how to accomplish it, but nevertheless, left to ourself without God's presence in it, we will not accomplish it in a way that brings glory to him, that fulfills his purpose. So a person that prays is a person that recognizes that spiritually he is insufficient, that he needs God in his life, for all pursuits, not just uh, kingdom pursuits, but for everything. He understands, in other words, his absolute dependence upon God. Verse 1, a prayer of David, and notice the first thing that David says, Shema Adonai, which means, hear, O Lord. Now, this is a term of wanting God's attention. And notice what David says immediately thereafter. He uses the word tzedek, which is righteousness. If you are interested in righteousness, you can be assured of something. God is going to get involved in your life. If you are not interested in righteousness, doing that which is right in God's perspective, then God's not going to be actively involved in your life. When you call out to him, there's not going to be a response. Now remember this word here, shema, it has to do with wanting one to hear and respond. And how David can be assured 
that God's going to respond, that he's going to move, is because David is saying to God, I have a righteous objective. And it's God, God's character, the very essence of God, that defines righteousness. And I said this before, and it's very important that we see the distinction. Everything that God does is righteous. Why is it righteous? Because he does them. Meaning this, God does not live up to a standard. God sets the standard. Very important that we see that. That he is the foundation, the origin of all things. So what God does is righteous. It is because God does it that we understand what righteousness is. Don't think that we can perceive righteousness apart from God. David understood this. So he says, hear, O Lord, and then the word righteousness. And then here's a great example of parallelism. And we know that Hebrew poetry, the primary, the primary characteristic is parallelism. And what's parallel to the word hear? It's the word listen. And then the next word is rinati, which is parallel to sedic righteousness. Now, rinati is my shout. So David is praying, but he is crying out in loudness. This is a shout that's usually rooted in excitement or enthusiasm. And what makes David excited? What is he enthusiastic about? It is righteousness. And here's the key. Here's the principle. When you are excited, enthused, committed, interested in righteousness, you can be assured that God is going to pay attention to you. He is going to hear your prayers. It goes on, and we see the third Hebrew verb for hearing or listening. He says... And literally, we can translate it. It's a verb, but we could say, give ear to. And this is the word for listening, hearing, that speaks of, of the word ear. Not just that you hear with your ear, but something is placed in the ear. It's usually the idea of drawing close and whispering something in a personal way. And this is what David is saying to God. This type of attitude drew David into the presence of God where God would listen to my prayer. Now, when we look here at this psalm, we're going to see that there's a characteristic. David says, my, whether it's my prayer, and we'll see over and over, my, my, my. That is going to be important later on when we get to verse 11. Because verse 11 is going to be a difficult verse to understand. And by and large, when you look at English translations, they will not rightly understand what verse 11 is saying. So in preparation for getting to verse 11, I want to share with you that this word my appears between verse 1 through the first 10 verses, approximately 20 times, whether we're speaking about first person possessive, as in my prayer, or we speak about David speaking of himself, I will do this, I will see this, I will say this. So it's about the first person. That is a grammatical term. First person is I, me. And David is speaking in the first person about himself personally in this psalm. Here again, that may seem confusing or why the emphasis on that? When we get to verse 11, we'll see that. I say that now so that you will pay attention to the use of that word my or I in this passage. Let's move to verse 2. Secondly, the end of verse 1, where it says, without, without deceit, my lips. So the end of verse 1, I want to make sure I don't skip anything. Below 
Mirma. With the lips, there is no, what he's saying is, there is no deceit. Now, this is also something that is very important, that when we go before God, we do so without any type of uh, untruthfulness, any type of something that is hidden. Our prayers need to be transparent before God. So let's read all of this first verse. A prayer of David, listen, O Lord, righteousness. Hear my shout. Give ear to my prayer, and his prayer comes before God, he says, with, without or with no lips of deceit. Now we're ready for verse 2. From before you, my judgment. Now notice, my. My judgment goes forth. And why this term where it says at the beginning, me lefanecha, from before you, my judgment goes forth. Meaning this, David wants to bring everything before God. Everything comes out of its origin is David thinking and giving consideration to God. What David is revealing to us, the reader, is that he does nothing without recognizing that God sees all things, and therefore we should be people that act, behave, speak, do with the recollection. Everything goes before God, and we need to be mindful of that. Secondly, it says, your eyes gaze, and this is a word for, for perceiving a vision. And this word vision, it's seen, but in a, a totality, meaning this. When, when God gives a person a vision, he sees things correctly. He sees things from God's perspective. Now, David is saying, God, you're looking at this. Your eyes behold this. And he uses this word for having a vision, simply referring to the reader. That once again, nothing is hidden. God has a total picture of what's going on. So he says, your eyes behold, and it's the word mesharim, which is straight things, that which is is proper. And that's what David is saying to God. I know that you see that which is proper. Why? When do we behave in a way that is right, the way that is straight, according to God's terminology, God's definition, meaning this, we, we don't want a crooked pathway. We want uprightness. And that's what that word, Mesharim, has to do with. And when we bring before, and here's the key, when we bring before God that which is upright, that which is straight, that which has integrity, what can we be assured of? God's going to get involved. God's going to, to join in that. He's going to be part of that. And that's what David wants. He wants God to be part of every aspect of his life. Verse 3. It's the word, it's a noun, but in the, in the verb, it's actually a verb, but in the noun form, it's a word for a test. So what David says here, and he says this frequently in the Psalms, he says, you have tested my heart. That's what God does. He doesn't look to the outward things. He doesn't evaluate us if we're a good dresser, if we have put on our makeup in a fine way that we have accessorized our garments in a magnificent way, God doesn't pay any attention to that. It says here, you have tested, and that means that you have arrived of the truth of what our heart condition. So God, he tests the heart, but once more, David says, my heart. Remember that first person. You have tested my heart and then another important word. And this is a word, it, it has to do with God getting involved. Now, this word, if you do a good study of it, and in our study of Isaiah, 
and also Ezekiel, we've come across it. It is very common, highly frequent in the scripture. And it means that God gets involved. It can be the word for visit, the word for redeem, the word for provide, but also the word for a punishment, a judgment. God uh, doing something it has an adverse effect upon the person, God's judgment. Now, here's the key. This word speaks basically about God getting all involved in a situation. I've said in our study, I believe of Exodus, that uh, this word is used in modern Hebrew, which means if I want to make a deposit at the bank. Now, how much of that money do I want going in? All of it. All of my deposit I want to find in my account. And this word speaks of God getting involved. So God, he's going to get involved. He's going to be highly involved in your life. And he checks the heart to see how he's going to respond. So this word is a word for a response of God, how he's going to respond to a person, and it's based upon your heart condition. It says that he's going to, to test your heart and you have visited, and there's the word, Lila, at night. Now, what does that mean? Why the term night? Well, simply, that at nighttime, we, we stop, we're asleep, but God continues to work. So God looks at our heart, he tests our heart, and he brings about changes in our situation. Throughout the night, God can work and do great things while, while we're asleep. Darkness is also related to night. Things we don't see how God works in, in darkness, but he works in the hidden places, in the things that we can't see, that we can't discern. So God works oftentimes in a way that we don't discern his activity, but we see the results of his activity verse 3 the second part you have refined me here's another example of me or my or i david is speaking he says to god you have refined me and then it says bow timsa which means what bow is a negation timsa fine now this word for for testing or trying, or refining. It's the, the same word that uh, a jeweler, when he wants to make something, he'll take a, a, a precious metal, let's say gold, and he'll melt it down, he'll heat it up. And he will remove that which is impure, that which doesn't belong there, that which is not gold. And in that same way, what David is saying is this. God, he is going to try us and remove that which is displeasing to him, that which is not appropriate. But David's saying, I come before you, and you're not going to find any unfit, improper objectives. David is committed to the things of God in this verse. Now, this psalm is a great example of how we should think and how we should be. So he says, you have refined me, and you will not find meaning anything unfit. I have, once again, first person, I have, and this is a word for, for an objective. I have set an objective. I have made a purpose. And what is that purpose that, that David is committed to? That uh, will not pass, and this is a word for transgress my mouth. David has said he has purpose, and the idea here is purpose in his heart. Made a decision that his mouth is not going to speak that which is sinful. He is not going to speak that which transgresses the will of God. What God sees as appropriate, what's proper. So David, and we go through this, he says, you know, test my heart. You, you test my, my life, my very being. 
Anything that's improper, they're not going to be there. But if it is, I want removed. I'm not going to speak any deceit. Notice these things David is telling us about how he wants to serve God, the type of man that he wants to be. So he says, I have, have purpose. I have made my objective that my mouth does not transgress. Verse 4. This is word for activity, but it's in the, the plural, activities. So he continues and he says, For the activities of man is in the word of your, your lips. So what David is saying here is this. Our actions should be based upon the words of God. He gives us instruction. He gives us vision. He gives us what we ought to do. So once more, the, the activities of man is in the words of your lips. I will keep, and this is a word for guard, I will keep that which is precious. Why? He says, I'm going to guard myself. That's literally what it says. Ani shamarti. For I, I will guard. Why? From the, the pathways of the wicked. So David is saying this. It is only when I base my activity upon what comes from the mouth of God, meaning scripture. That is how I keep myself from what? The pathway, the courses, the direction, the journeys of who? This is a word for someone who is wicked, who bursts forward into where he ought not be. Now, the idea here is this. You have an animal, for example, in a pen, and he stays in that pen, and there he is provided for. He's taken care of. But here's the problem. When he bursts forth there, he's going where he wants to go. And what happens? He finds himself in danger. He's moving away from the source of his provision, what he needs for life. And that's why David is saying here, we ought to base our decisions upon your words, what comes forth from your lips, O God. And this is how we guard ourselves, we keep ourselves from finding ourselves on the pathways, on the courses of the wicked one. Verse 5. Support my steps in your, and this would be in your cycles, in your course. So David is saying here, and it's a very important word that he uses here. This is a word for support, giving aid to, assistance to. And he's saying here, God, I want to walk in your place. I want to go in your circles. And the only way I can do that is if you support my steps in doing it. David realizes he can't be in the will of God unless God supports him in that. That God helps him in that. What it speaks is this. We are totally, and I want to emphasize this, we are totally dependent upon God. So he says, support, support my steps and your, your courses. Then he says, in order that my steps, and it's a different world, word, and it's parallelism, so we have one word for steps, and we have another word for steps or paces, that, that it says here that they will not uh, fall or move or collapse. So it's speaking here, this is what the text is telling us. When God supports our steps and places us in where he wants us to be in the right course of direction, then we can have assurance that our, our, our steps, our walking is not going to, to be moved away from where we should be. We're not going to collapse, in other words. Verse 6, I have called unto you, for you have answered me, Oh God. Now, some of the commentators point out that this is a, a verse of assurance. 
What David is saying is this, everything that we've studied up until this verse, if we apply it to our life, if we make that the reality of our life, then we can be assured, look now to verse 6, we can be assured that when we call out to you, O Lord, that you are going to answer, that you'll hear us. As David says, I've called out to you because you have or you will answer me, O God. Place your ear unto me and listen to my speech, my word. Now, what David is saying here is this. What we've studied thus far before this verse, it positions us where we can have assurance if we do these things that God's going to hear our prayers and that he is going to be actively involved in our life. But here's the key. He will only be active in all of our life. When we want to shut certain things out, when we hold things back, what we need to realize is this. When we say, God, I got this myself. You, you, you don't deal with this, God. This is my domain. When we have our own personal domain apart from God, God removes himself. He withdraws. Now you say, well, wait a second. The Bible says, and it's true, God will never leave me nor forsake me. That's true. You enter into a covenant relationship, he will not. But here's what I'm saying. When you hold things back from God, the measure that you use will be measured back to you. When you hold things back, even though God is still in a covenant relationship, he will withdraw his provision. He will not be active in your life. He hasn't left you for or forsake you, but your relationship with him is, is grieving him, and therefore there will be distance from God's activity, God's anointing, God's moving in your life. And what's the purpose of this? Not because he's left you or, or deserted you in order to get you to repent, because here's the truth. Those things that I want to hold back from God are things that I know that he wouldn't be pleased with, that are not part of his plan for me. If God is good, and he is, then we should want God's blessings, God's presence, God's anointing over every aspect of our life. Look now to, to verse 7. Verse 7 is a word of, of distinction. It is a, a word of, of also separation. Now, distinction and separation, it can speak of that which is unique, which has a distinct purpose and also releases us, separates us from those things that we ought not be connected to. And what is it that separates us? What is that makes us distinct? Well, notice what he says, chasadecha, your grace. And here's what's important. This word for grace is in the plural because it's an abundant grace. It is a, a multi-purpose grace. It is a grace that puts us where God wants us to be in order to accomplish the things that he wants us to do. Now, this grace also is the foundation for a covenantal relationship with him. And then he says, Moshia Hosim. Hosim are those who trust in what? Your grace, O oh God. And what does those who trust in the grace of God, what can they expect? Moshiach. Now, Moshiach is the word for Savior. It comes from the same word, Yeshua, which means salvation. So the Savior makes salvation. He provides salvation. Moshiach, Noten Yeshua, same word. And of course, the name for Messiah is Yeshua. Yeshua means one who saves. In a different form, it's Moshiach, and it provides salvation, Yeshua. So we read, your grace, this abundant grace, makes a distinction. 
It brings a Savior for those who trust. And it will cause those who trust in his grace. And notice what's parallel to his grace. It's his right hand. It's his, your right hand speaking to God. So the Savior and the gracious gift of God all relates to Messiah who is the right hand of God. And what does he do? He lifts us up. Now, let me be correct here. And it is true that even though the Savior is mentioned, what is parallel to your right hand is the grace of God. This grace that, that makes a distinction and brings salvation into the life of those who trust him. Verse 8, he says, keep me, and this is this another example of me or my or I, keep me as the apple. And this just means the, the pupil of your eye socket. And how do we do that? We want God to keep us. Now, the image here is very important. We know there's an expression for that which is very fast, a blink of an eye, a twink of an eye. And, and the pupil is very sensitive. You can just put a finger close to it, and my eye begins to water, even though nothing has touched it. So the question is this. How do we become that which is very sensitive to God, being he's sensitive over us? Well, he tells us this is the beauty of Hebrew poetry. Notice what it says. Betzel kanafecha. In the corner of or in the shadow of your wings now wings is the word corner and it all relates to the titsit we know that the word for that fringe garment that talit that prayer shawl is called a four corner garment the word for corner here is kanaf arba kanfot four corners on each corner there's that titsit so when it talks about the shadow of your wings it's speaking about a reference to the commandments so it's when i am living under the shadow that is the influence of the commandments of god what does god do he hides me that is he it's parallel to the word he keeps me he guards me he preserves me how does he do that? Well, he does so because I'm precious to him. He is sensitive about me because I'm like the pupil of his eye because I am what? I am located in the influence under the shadow of his wings. I have taken serious his instruction. Verse 9. From because of, let's translate it this way, because of wicked ones, this one does what? Because of wicked one, this wicked one, in other words, he oppresses me or, or, or the word can be really strips me bare. It's a word for, for plundering as well. So because of wicked ones, this one oppresses me. My enemies against my soul, they, they surround me. So now David is under attack. That's what he's saying here in, in verse 9. Verse 10 continues on. David is under attack. It's the word for fat. And it says that, that their fat ones do what? Close me in. It's another word for being oppressed. And it says their mouth speaks pride. And in this case, it's, it's pride, but it speaks about how they are exalting themselves up for the demise, for the attack, for the destruction of David. So David is under attack, and notice where we're going in this psalm, verse 11. Now, remember, I said verse 11, and what I would do if I were you is that I would seriously study Many translations of verse 11. Now, some ignore a word. There's a word, and many of the more literal translations will translate it, our steps. 
Let me share with you how most English translates this word. Verse 11. Our steps now, they surround us. So what it means in one sense is that we are, are walking and the enemy, they surround us. But here's the problem. Us. Who's the us? Remember I emphasize over and over that it's me, my, I? Where's the us here? Well, it's interesting because if you look at the word for surrounding, where it says, Siva Vunu, it says that it's actually written, not nu, but ni, which changes from us to me. And then if we look carefully, and see, this is what I did. As I go through the biblical language, in this case, Hebrew, I translate it. And I pay attention because there are different manuscripts. Now, there is an original, I mean, David wrote this. But the problem is, we have different manuscripts of this psalm. And oftentimes, you'll find that there's two primary texts, meaning this. Some will write this word, the first word that's translated our steps. They will write it differently. They'll use the same letters, but the vowel pointing will be different. And instead of the vav being final, it will be a yud. Now, you may not understand that from a Hebrew point of view, but that's okay. And what happens is this. Let's say that, that we have 400 manuscripts of this verse. And we have 397 stating one thing. And three stating something different. Now, when I say stating something different, I'm talking about a letter being different. And the problem is this. If you know the Hebrew alphabet, you make the yud, which is like a, a part of a seven, the top, and just goes down a little bit, like a square, a quarter. But if you draw that down, it becomes a vav. So it's very common that you have manuscripts where some have the vav, that letter vav, and some have the yud. Now, because of that, if you have numerous ones one way and just a couple, you could probably arrive at the conclusion that the 397 is right and the three is a, a mistake. But what happens when you have, we'll give this same example, 400 manuscripts? And 204 have it one way, and 196 has it the other way. And here again, we're just talking about one letter, if it is long or short, one part of it. Did the scribe go down, or did he stop? It's a human issue. It's not attacking the authority of the text, but it's attacking the the perfected man we're not perfect we make errors so looking at this and maybe it was that it was a little bit longer and someone said oh i don't think it's a a yud i think it's a vav and then therefore it was copied over and over in one school one area this way and another where this way so what do you do when you have 400 manuscripts 196 one way 204 another way it's almost 50 50. Well, what do you do? You check the Septuagint. That is the Greek translation. And you see if it offers any clarity, and it does. It goes with one of them and not with the other. So in that case, we can see that the phrase, our steps, is really not our steps. But it's a, another way if you, you punctuate and there was not punctuations. You had to simply understand it. And sometimes the punctuations can make a big deal in the meaning.
Now, when we look at the Septuagint, first verse 11, it says, they cast me away. Notice the me, not us, me. So you have numerous manuscripts, primary texts that are put together, use it this way, and it goes along with the Septuagint. It says, they cast me away now, and they surround me. That's what the Septuagint has, and that's what numerous Hebrew manuscripts have, not what, for example, is in most English translations. Their eyes, they place. So they're looking upon me, and notice what it says, lintot ba'arts. Their eyes, in this case, they, what does it say? They are placed, they place their eyes upon the ground. What does that mean? They want to bring me to subjection. Here's the, the verse. David is saying he's got an enemy. And this enemy, what are they doing? They're casting him out, meaning this. They're taking him out. They surround him. And their intention, it's an idiom, when it says they, they cast their eyes to the ground. What it means is, they want to, it's a Hebrew idiom which speaks of bringing David to defeat, to destruction. Verse, verse 12. But notice what, what God says here. David speaks and he says, his likeness, who's that? God. Third person, plural. His likeness is like a, a lion. And he rises up he desires a like a prayer a prey meaning this as a lion rises up when he sees dinner some prey he desires it like a young lion that dwells in the hidden places what ready to pounce so the image is this these enemies of david have surrounded him they are about David's defeat. But David says, you know how I liken God? He is like a lion. Think of the lion of Judah. He is likened to a lion that, that desires prey, meaning to eat. And, and a young lion that dwells in the hidden places. And then he says, rise up, O Lord, and do what? It's a word, kadma, which is to go before. It means it can be a word of confrontation. So he says, look at verse 12 or verse 13. Rise up, O Lord, contend before him and do what? Make him to submit. And my, and it goes back to that first person, my soul will escape from the wicked one, and then it says, by your sword. By what? God. And the word here for sword, it's a normal word for sword, but it can have the idea of the word of the Lord Messiah. When he comes back, he's going to have a sword of his mouth. He's just going to speak. And that's what David is saying. God, if you just speak this out, it's like a sword separating me from the the plans of the enemy look at verse 14 now we just have two more verses to do but let me tell you in the same way that i had to spend serious time on verse 11 going through different uh, texts different reference books to understand this the same thing is said in in verse 14 verse 15 is an easy verse to understand 14 is not Verse 14, you have to pay close attention to what he's saying. Now, it begins with the word mimtin. Now, some would point out the word mate has to do with human beings, men. So, we'll go with that understanding of it. So, from men, your hand, O Lord. Your hand speaks about the hand of God. That, that separates us from evil men. 
those who are enemies. And by the way, the Septuagint has this understanding of these men. It renders it just with that, the word enemy. So from enemies, these men who are our enemies or David's enemies, it says, your hand, O Lord. Then it has that same word, from men, from the world. Now, what David is saying here is this. Verse 14 speaks about David having a, a resurrection hope. David leaving, being separated from this world. Here's the key. There are individuals and their, their glory is in their children, the next generation. They want their children to carry on their, their heritage, their, their uh, the word Moreshit, their, their heritage, I guess is the best word. They want to live in that next generation, not David. David is thinking about the kingdom. Now, we should prepare the next generation for the kingdom, but we don't take that which is precious and we invest it in simply the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. No, we are kingdom-minded. So David says, from men, from the world. He's not interested in the things of this world. Speaking of men from the world, he says their portion is in life, this life. That's what they're interested in. And your treasured things, those things that are treasured by God, what do they do? They fill, you fill their belly. That's what they do. God gives treasures things and they just put it in their belly. Also, we find as we keep reading, they are, are satisfied with children and they leave their abundance to their babes. Their, and it's simply a word for, synonym for children, meaning this. They invest in their children and we know biblically we should teach our children diligently the things of God. But that's not what this verse is saying. It's speaking about how they want their heritage, their name, their objectives, what their life is about to carry on in the next generation. Well, what does David do? Verse 15, our last verse, is in contrast to that. He says, I. And, and some Bibles recognizing this contrast puts but me or but I in righteousness. It goes back to where we were in verse 1. David, he's saying, I in righteousness, I will gaze unto your face. What is David saying? I, I'm not interested in just carrying on my heritage from one generation to another, that my name will never die out. Now, lots of times people do that. They name buildings out of the, after themselves. Their, their place, they make their, their tomb a memorial. They want people to visit it. They set it up so people come and say, wow, look at such a tomb. This man must have been a great one if he can have a tomb that big. This is not David's objective. This is not what a disciple of Messiah thinks about. David says, I in righteousness. And the idea here is in righteousness, by means of righteousness, I will gaze, remember that word for vision, I will see completely your presence, your face. This face of God also relates to blessing. And he says, I will be satisfied. And notice this next word, behakits. Behakits, the word tets, is end. Behakits, it's a word for waking someone up. And the rabbinical commentators, and I believe most Christian commentators, see this as also a reference to the resurrection. So David is saying here, it is because I have a righteous objective that I am going to behold the blessings of God, be in his presence, see his face, where I will be satisfied when I come to an end. 
David is not loathing or, or in misery about death. David understands that his end comes with a new beginning, a resurrection. And notice what he says here, Timunatecha. What's that? Your picture, your image. It's in parallelism to your presence. So David is telling us he's interested in righteousness, in the objectives of God, not in the things of this world, because this world's coming to an end. David thinks about resurrection. What is that? The life to come. Because there he knows something. He is going to behold fully, completely the face of God. That he is going to see the very image, the reflection of God. And being in the presence of God, knowing God, seeing God, this is David's motivation. And if that's your motivation, then you're going to be committed to righteousness. That's how this psalm began in verse 1, and that's how it's ending in verse 15. When you are committed to the righteousness of God, You are going to be brought into his presence. You are going to experience his blessings. And you are going to know the satisfaction of beholding the living God. That was David's expectation. And that should be our expectation as well. And when that expectation is our hope, we will not be disappointed. Well, let's close until next week when we begin Psalm 18. Until then, may God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.